Okay, so I'm going to talk about the ends of the Earth, the beginning of the universe, and how we can study the Big Bang from the South Pole, which I've been to uh, seven times for this research. I've been about the South Pole for about a year, and it turns out it's a really unique place to actually look out at the light left over from the Big Bang. Um, and this is the project I work on, uh, the South Pole Telescope, uh, which we're, we're going to use. So I should take this off. I'll need this later when I go back outside, but I think for now it's going to get a little warm. Uh, all right. Okay, so uh, the big, let's see, uh oh, the big clicker is not working. <laughs> clicker's not, yeah, it's on. It's on and it's on. Yeah, see, what light? So, all right, all right, next slide. Yeah, the laser works. All right, next slide, sorry. All right, so the big question we're trying to ask is how did the universe begin? And we were pretty sure the universe began with a big bang, uh, followed very quickly soon after by a period of inflation where uh, basically quantum fluctuations expanded to the size of the universe in only about 10 to the minus 34 seconds. Uh, and this was followed by this continued expansion where the big bang continued. Uh, this expansion from the setup in the big bang continued. All right, next slide. So this is what it would look like, you know, sped up trillions and trillions of times in size and speed. So what you're looking at here is actually a, a baby picture of the universe. These all sky map of the, this cosmic microwave background, this light left over at the Big Bang, was light emitted only 400,000 years after the Big Bang. Uh, and we're getting an image of what the universe looked like at that time. It was a completely different state. There were no stars, there were no galaxies. These are fluctuations of the very early universe. All right, uh, next slide. All right, so I know what you're thinking. Uh, uh, that's, that's, that sounds pretty fantastical, but you know, we really think it's true. Next slide. So, and it's easy to forget how long the Big Bang Theory really existed. It was proposed, actually, somewhat ironically, by a Belgian priest, Georges Lemaitre, in 1927. Uh, and it was just, uh, the Big Bang Theory itself is just saying that the universe began in a very hot, dense state and then expanded from some initial explosion. And that's all, sort of gener generically all it's saying. And even six years later, after he proposed it, uh, Albert Einstein said of the Big Bang Theory, it, this is the most beautiful and satisfactory explanation of creation to which I have ever listened. And so Einstein was convinced. So only after six years after it was proposed. So already we thought we really knew it happened. All right, next slide. So why did we think it happened? Well, very soon after that, we discovered that the universe was expanding. So Edmund Hubble, when he looked out at galaxies, distant galaxies, uh, what he found surprisingly was that not only were those galaxies moving away from us, all of them, but the further away a galaxy was, the faster it moved. And this is the uh, so-called Hubble's law, which basically measures the velocity, this recession of a galaxy versus the distance. And this is a, a sort of modern measurement that we've updated with much better precision today. This relationship holds out for hundreds of millions of light years. Things that are farther away are moving faster away from us. And that's why we think the universe is expanding. Next slide. Next. So the real reason we're, we, one of the big reasons we really think the Big Bang happened was the discovery of the Cosmic Microwave Background, or CMB, uh, discovered by Penzias and Wilson in New Jersey in 1965. Um, and what they found was when they looked up at the night sky with their microwave telescope, that they discovered that the sky was glowing with microwave radiation just everywhere they looked. And it was so bright uh, that if you actually took a census of all the electromagnetic radiation in the universe, you know, where did all the light in the universe come from? Over 90% of it is in this light from the Big Bang. So it's extremely energetic. It's literally, if you took it, summed all the light ever emitted by all the stars that ever exist in the history of the universe, this would be over 10 times brighter. So it's extremely bright. And it's not that surprising because literally it's an image of the time when the universe was on fire. Literally, we're looking back at a time when the universe was about the temperature of the surface of the sun. So it's literally a fireball. And so it's sort of not surprising that it's still so bright and we can still see it today, even when they weren't trying. All right, next slide. So another surprising fact about the, this microwave background, this light from the Big Bang, is the best place to observe it in the world is from the South Pole. And it's really due to the unique conditions at the South Pole. It's high altitude. This is a picture. You're on a two-mile-thick ice sheet, so you're relatively high. But what really makes it unique and special is that it's extremely dry, and that's just because you know, in, in the winter, when the air gets to be minus 100 degrees Fahrenheit, it literally cannot hold much water vapor. It's just really, it's very dry. All right, thanks. 
think this will work now. Excellent. All right. So uh, um, in addition, it's a very stable atmosphere. You know, there's a, you're at the axis of the Earth. So there's a six-month-long day followed by a six-month-long night. So there's not that daily rising and setting of the sun. The atmosphere is not getting churned up by that action. During that six-month-long winter when it's so cold and so dry, the atmosphere is extremely stable. So it really makes it unique a place to do these observations of this microwave background from the Big Bang. So how do you get there? Well, first we fly to New Zealand commercially, uh, land in Christchurch, New Zealand. It's about the same latitude as Chicago, right? So, you know, to get to the South Pole, we literally have to, you know, be equivalent from us in Chicago going to the North Pole. So uh, we have to take two military flights, one to the coast of Antarctica, and then a second flight to the South Pole. This is what it looks like. We take these LC-17 military jets. We land on sea ice. This is about 10 foot of sea ice. We have to spend a couple days in McMurdo. This is me here on a little hike. Basically looks like a sort of a dirty Alaskan mining town. Spend a couple days there. If you're lucky, penguins might show up. The penguins are, <laughs> the penguins are like migrating along the coast. So it's a really good opportunity. You can oftentimes see penguins when you're uh, traveling through McMurdo. Then you have to take another flight. This one's on skis. It's a propeller plane. It's an LC-130. You have to take another three-hour flight to the South Pole. And then here we are, established in 1957, the U.S. Uh, Edmonton Scott South Pole Station. And there, there's about a station that can house about 150 scientists, logistical support uh, people to help support the science down there. So when I go down, it's usually in the summer. So it's right now. You know, it's our winter. It's their summer. They're in sort of three months where the South Pole is accessible by plane. You know, when I'm there, it's sort of similar to Chicago winter. It's sort of maybe minus 30, minus 40 Fahrenheit a lot of time we're there. So, so I'm, here I am bundled up uh, on, a, on a sled, again, hauled out to the telescope. And then when you get out to the telescope, this is what you see. Here, here's me again in this big red parka. But then you have to remember that you have to zoom out. So this telescope that we're using is really big. It's a 10 meter uh, te diameter telescope, about 30 feet diameter. And it's the largest telescope in the world doing these observations of this light from the Big Bang. So what does that get you? So very early on, I showed this image of what this, uh, this CMB looked like from this WMAP satellite pictured here. So what, with this same patch of sky, this is sort of several degrees across. Here's the moon for scale. What would it look like observed with our telescope? All right, so here's going to transition, the same patch of sky. Wow. So what, what happens is that big telescope gives you fine angular resolution. So it's like putting on glasses, basically. You're going from this blurry image to a really high resolution where you can start seeing all new sorts of structure. This is actually a much deeper map as well, so you get a lot more information from that. These large-scale fluctuations that you're seeing here, these ripples, are literally you know, the fireball from the Big Bang, like slight fluctuations in that very early universe before there were stars, before there were galaxies. All right. So you know, what, do we, what do we learn from this? So it's, one thing is the incredibly unique image of the universe. We're looking at the universe at a, such a different time in its history. And what's really powerful about this is we can compare this image to what the universe looks like today and to start asking, well, what is the universe made of? And it's so powerful because this is a time before there were stars, before there were galaxies, where there's nothing had formed yet. These quantum fluctuations stretch to these huge scales. But given 14 billion years, it has to look like the universe that we know around us today, where there's stars, there are galaxies, planets. So how do we get there? It's, it's an incredibly powerful test of what the universe is both made of and how it's evolving. And it can, we can use that to understand the history of the universe and the, what is the content. So what is the content? So it's and really surprising. One thing that we now know is that only about 5% of the universe is made out of regular matter, like atoms, like what you and me are made out of. 95% uh, of it is dark, uh, where we can't see it. It's, we know it's there. It's influencing the universe on large scales, but we don't know what it is. Um, about one quarter of it is this stuff we call dark matter, which has gravity, uh, but it does not emit any light. It does not emit light, does not absorb light in any way that we can see. We've already ruled out that it's not dim or dead stars, it's not planets, it's not some problem with gravity, uh, but it's, we think it's some sort of new particle. And there's, at Fermilab and other particle accelerators in the world, there's a big race to try to find these particles and accelerators. Uh, but still, the bulk of it seems to be this thing called dark energy, about three quarters. And one thing that we found is that expansion that Hubble measured in Hubble's uh, law, velocity versus distance, what's strange is that expansion's accelerating for some reason we don't know. You'd think that there's an expansion seeded from the Big Bang, gravity would eventually slow it down, bring the universe, at least slow it down, if not bring it back together. But no, it's accelerating. We don't know why. Uh, and we sort of cause, you know, we've just created something that we call dark energy to explain that, that needs to be there, that has exerting some pressure uh, on the universe, but we don't know really what it is. And this is one of the biggest questions now in cosmology and astrophysics is, 
We know, we, do, we know they're there. We can see that they're there. But what are dark matter and dark energy really? We, you know, it's a big question. We don't really know. Uh, so it's really exciting. This also means you know, there's a lot to learn still. And that's why we're still trying to do these measurements and still trying to learn out what the universe is made out of. And you know, if you ever you know, make it to the South Pole, you know, look me up. It's a great place to visit. <laughs> Thank you.